Awen has just oh, okay. started it. She will right. confirm. I see that the live streaming is now on. It just it takes is. a minute to catch okay. up. To see that it's okay, on. let me know. Okay, we're live. Thank you. All right, I want to welcome everybody to our March 26th meeting. Uh, we are now live stream. I'd like to call the meeting to order and I'll get a certification of quorum, please. Yeah, I can confirm that we have quorum with 22 members currently. All right, thank you. I just have a couple of uh, brief remarks. Uh, one is that the um, Grand River Conservation Foundation Community Conservation Grant applications will launch in the coming days. Information on these grants can be found on the Federation's website, on the, sorry, on the Foundation's website. And the second item is in April, early April, we're gonna be hosting a town hall event with the GRCF chair, uh, Wayne Fife. Um, and what it's specifically for donors of the Guelph Lake Nature Center. There've been some questions about where the project sits and where we are and what's going on. And some of the donors are um, you know, wondering where their money is and how the project's moving. So what we're gonna do is have a town hall meeting with, with, with the, uh, invite all the donors along and just let them know exactly where we are. The money's in the bank. Um, the board's position has not changed since the last confirmation. Uh, there may be some concerns around some of the uh, conservation legislation changes, depending on how we can fund the operational piece. If they pull municipal levy dollars from operational pieces in order to run the nature center, we may have to find a different way to fund it. And I, the, the staff is looking at and working at that. But we just want to touch base with the donors because you know there's a lot of projects out there and they could go anywhere. And we want to make sure that they're happy and that we're communicating with them. And I also think that we've got a, we need to absolutely sit down with the, the, the foundation and make sure we've got a really strong MOU that lays out exactly who's doing what, who's communicating and so forth. Because I think we got a bit of a gap about who's taking responsibility for what. So um, I'll be hosting that town hall meeting and we'll let you know how that goes uh, and, and we'll take it from there. And those who can't make the town hall, we will certainly, um, you're reaching out to them. Kathy, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, again, I didn't catch the date and time of that. And will, will the board members be informed about when that is? Because it might be something in Guelph that we want to let the, the general public know about. It well, no, it's not a public. It's for the okay. donor. Okay, so it's only for, can board members that can attend then, right? Okay. But yeah, but I'm, it's just, so if I put in, I have no idea. So I've put a hundred thousand bucks into this project mm -hmm. and I, I just want to reach out to them and say, hey, here's where we are and here's- okay. Is what we're doing and we're because we've got the double whammy right we've got the legislation plus the pandemic stopped a bunch of stuff and yep. so the constant communication wasn't there but um certainly board members can come along and that would um, be great if we need then after that and we can decide as we go to have some kind of public event absolutely right there's no issue with that really the intention here is to focus on the donors okay that's great and i don't have the exact date yet because um uh, we're doing a, a meeting doodle thing to try to nail it down because the, some of the main donors couldn't make our original date. So you're probably looking at second week of April, but we'll have that date in no time. That doodle's going out Monday, so we'll know right away. Thanks. As long as we can be notified, that's great. Absolutely. Okay. And that's it for my chair's remarks. Um, I've got a little amendment to the agenda I wanted to review. So we've got a, a, a delegation with regards to the Greenbelt Ella Haley. Uh, came in after the agenda was published. So she'll be presenting at item eight. And uh, we've got Pam Walther maybe is providing a presentation on item nine with regards to the conservation area operations. So I have a motion here, motion that the agenda for the general membership be approved as amended. Uh, moved by John, seconded by Warren. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, I have the minutes of the previous meeting motion that the minutes of the annual general meeting of February 26, 2021 be approved as circulated. Can I get a mover for that? Moved by Bernie, seconded by Bruce. Any opposed? That's carried. Can everybody hear me fine? Is everything good? Okay. Um, no business arising from previous. Okay, so we're right into delegations, I believe. So we're going to have Ella Haley on behalf of the Sustainable Brant and Better Brant Regrowing the Greenbelt uh, presentation. So I'll invite staff to invite her in and away we'll go. She, she'll have 10 minutes.
Okay, Ella has joined the meeting. Uh, we're ready to go when you are, Mr. Chair. Okay. Hey, I'm sorry. I thought you. Hi, Ella. How are you? Good. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. And I'll just turn the floor over to you. Go ahead. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, uh, I am speaking from slides that were prepared by uh, Joan uh, Fox. I had a death in the family, so she's done much of the background work here. We both come from Sustainable Brandt. It's a not-for-profit in Brandt County. We've been working to grow the green belt since um, about 2008 or 9. I come from a multi-generational fa family farm as well on the east end of Brandt County. Uh, and so next slide. So just this is an overview of the map for the consultation for the green belt. If you look at Brantford, you'll see that uh, if you go straight east of Brantford there, there's a huge swath of land that's not included in the study area. That's our community, our farming community. It abuts the uh, Grand River watershed that's protected at the uh, green belt line. Uh, it's a very political line to protect the Grand River watershed in Hamilton, but then it stops a half a field away from our farm and from our farming community. So uh, this consultation is asking about potential areas to expand, and they're including the Paris Gulf Moraine, uh, specifically they're talking about that, and uh, protecting urban river valleys. Uh, this is just a map for discussion, so we can ask for other priorities. And uh, so that's partly why we're coming to you because you protect the Grand River watershed and uh, we'd like to see more of it protected. We have headwaters uh, and many streams in this area east of Brantford and it's totally overlooked. Next slide. Here's a map of the Paris Gold Moraine that Joan uh, found. It's, it's a report from Blackport Hydrology from 2009. Uh, it's much larger than the uh, uh, Paris Gold Moraine that's presented in the study area. You'll see that it extends uh, much further into the County of Brandt and down into Norfolk County. So we'd like uh, for other resources to be examined as well when uh, this um, consultation is being conducted. Next slide. Um, you'll see that in the Green Belt, a lot of urban river valleys are protected or being considered for protection. Uh, all of these river, river valleys there, they uh, draw their water from Lake Ontario. Uh, so um, uh, we draw our water or, or uh, we, we draw our water mainly from groundwater. So next slide. Okay. Uh, so the people in the Grand River watershed get their water from municipal wells, private wells and the Grand River. We all rely upon groundwater or surface water and groundwater relies on aquifers that are recharged by rainwater and snowmelt open green space, wetlands, forested areas, all help to provide areas where the aquifer can be recharged. It requires rivers and streams to recharge it. The water table is not fixed. It varies with the season and precipitation. Groundwater moves. The groundwater within the Grand River watershed is connected and it needs contiguous protected protection. Next slide. Next slide. Um, yeah, so just wanted to point out that development fragments the natural and agricultural systems in Southern Ontario, including in the County of Brant. Uh, it interferes with aquifer recharge and the ability of rainwater to soak into the ground. Um, large areas of Southern Ontario are unprotected by the green belt, such as the Grand River watershed. Uh, we have certain policies that offer protection, but some in some municipalities offer more protection than others, including the region of Waterloo. Um, we lose about 175 acres of farmland every day. This is not sustainable. So in light of the amount of farmland available and the pressures that are imposed by the climate emergency, we need to protect more land and watersheds in Southern Ontario and natural heritage. Next slide. Uh, so here's the Grand River watershed. Uh, uh, and you'll see uh, we're focusing more on cent the central area. Uh, we're working also with a, a coalition, Greenbelt West. So we're looking at Brant County, uh, Wellington, Waterloo, looking at protecting the Grand River watershed in that area. Um, 
Okay, uh, you can see uh, the, the green belt, uh, you see the Grand River watershed, and then you'll see how it is protected in Hamilton. You look just east of Brantford, you'll see the Brant Hamilton border. And so you see one key question is why would it be protected by the green belt in Hamilton? And then that protection stops for us in Brant County, Wellington, Waterloo. Next slide. So we've worked with a coalition of uh, environmental groups, uh, uh, farming groups throughout Southern Ontario. Uh, and you'll see that we've made a blue belt map here uh, based on extensive hydrological information. I've worked in the past with GRCA staff to help me get uh, hydrological data. Uh, and so you'll see that this is a proposal for the government to look at. It's, it's had extensive research, it's called the blue belt. And so I'm sharing that with you so that you can uh, uh, look at this and consider this as a, another option for expanding the green belt. I'll give you a close up, next slide. So here's the uh, Grand River watershed in Brant County, mainly in Brant County, you'll see it extends into Waterloo there. Uh, and so, uh, uh, we, we've looked at the moraine, but we've also looked at headwaters, streams, and so we're saying that we need to um, have contiguous protection with the protected area in the green belt in Hamilton uh, and uh, avoid fragment fragmentation of the heritage, natural heritage system and the agricultural system. Uh, next slide. And so all of you, I think, are aware of this famous author, John Bemrose from, uh, from Paris. And he wrote this statement for us when we were trying to do a consultation about the green belt a few years ago. Without a healthy natural world, without wild places and free running water, all of our wealth will be eventually count for nothing. And so um, just wanted to, uh, just one moment here, I'll just check my notes as I finish up. Uh, yeah, so we're just asking uh, you to also consider uh, in your consultations with the province to look at uh, protecting uh, the Grand River watershed in Brant, Waterloo, Wellington, to make sure that we have contiguous protection uh, from the existing green belt, just continue. It should not be a political line that protects part of the Grand River watershed and not the rest. Thank you. All right, Ella, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. So members of the board, are there any questions or comments? Anything at this time? All right. Well, I wanna thank you on behalf of the board for your presentation and uh, we certainly look at it with interest. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Okay. Bye-bye. So the next presentation we have is um, the Conservation Area's 2021 Operations Update from Pam, author maybe. Pam, um, welcome. Is she, I can't. Thank you. There you are. Mr. Chair, okay. I'm here now. What's <laughs> yours? All right. I'll just wait for the presentation to load. Maybe. Hmm. It's coming. Great. I can just... Uh, I can start a little bit while it loads and we'll keep get this moving. So the conservation areas are anticipating a really busy 2021 season and natural spaces have continued to remain popular throughout COVID and they, they're really sought after and they're really hot commodities, which is great. But similar to last year, the pandemic requires modifications to continue with how we do business. And I'm gonna share a few of these modifications and further expand on some of our best business practices uh, with you in the presentation today. All right. So Karen, if you could move me to the second slide. Yeah, I'm waiting for the slideshow to start, sorry. Oh, okay. There's just a slight delay. Yeah, thank you. So overnight camping reservations will open on April the 6th and we're really excited about that. We did delay the month, um, delay the date of opening by a month, allowing our customers to have more time to better understand what COVID would mean to them prior to booking and hopefully resulting in fewer cancellations or potential cancellations. It also gave us a chance to have a clearer picture of what summer and Grand River conservation areas could look like. One of the ways we are measuring our availability to respond to the public changing or changing public health orders is that we've only opened up our reservations by 50% initially. 
This overnight camping capacity can be increased by us internally between about 80 and even in some cases, potentially 100% at parks like Grant and Bing. And that depends on current restrictions. So we can control how many reservations are available. Camping capacity has, is, very, is variable and it has factors such as day use considerations and park open space and how people are using the park. We're also happy to be providing flush toilets this year, starting on May 1st. And I know that sounds silly, but it's a really big deal for people. And we'll still have our traditional vault privies or outhouses open, um, but showers will remain closed. Maintenance staff who would normally be cleaning showers twice or more per day are gonna be utilized to help disinfect our washrooms um, more, increase disinfection. We're also disinfecting our water taps, garbage pails, and trailer waste dumping stations. Another capacity management tool will be the elimination of group camping in 2021. We would have groups from 20 to 200 booking our large sites and with public health protocols and potential changes, the program would be challenging to administer with unknown group sizes. And since we're not offering group camping, we can use the available space for that and help increase our visitation availability So main, and maintaining good physical distance. Next slide, please. In 2020, we offered seasonal camping starting on June 15th. And this year, we're happy to open on May the 1st, the same as previous years. Like 2020, we're welcoming our seasonal campers to register with an appointment. This reduces lineups, wait times, and allows for the license registration to have a thorough review. Appointments also allow staff to disinfect in between customers and to provide excellent customer service. And just um, as a point of information, we have 614 seasonal sites available this year. And they're mostly full. Um, we have a lottery process in place and that's how they fill up, but we're looking in good shape for these seasonals. We're also piloting a program at two of our conservation areas to work through a version of online registration for seasonal campsites. And this innovative solution would streamline the license process and create a system for cloud-based data management that could be rolled out um, uh, to other parks as the season progresses. So we're gonna consider that for next year. Next slide, please. Day use visitation. Our conservation areas are popular year round and COVID has introduced many new customers to GRCA and we will be open for them to visit unless mandated differently, but we have capacity plans and operational plans that allow for safe visitation with physical distancing measures. Our beaches will be open and so will our day use washrooms. We will continue to provide access to trails for hiking, biking, birding, walking, and general visitation. We have open areas for picnicking and the sports fields will remain open for families to enjoy their own game of choice. As part of our capacity plans, we'll be monitoring the beaches and spaces for overcrowding and remind people to stay in their own groups. The playgrounds will be open for um, access and we'll ask users to self sanitize. And we'll also have memorial groves open and available for people to visit and remember their loved ones. The places where we have paused for our regular program are those that require not only an increase in labor for disinfection reasons, but rather they're the areas where potential collection points and congestion of people that are forced to gather to wait for an item. And these are places like our boat rental concession, facility rentals, things like multifamily picnics and the food concessions. So they will be closed for this year. Next slide, please. Pools and splash pads. This operation was a difficult decision this year. Folks at Brand and Bing drafted operational assessments that weighed the options within the current frameworks from the Lifesaving Society of Canada, public health and known pro COVID protocols that are applying to municipal pools. And after a thorough review, it was determined that it's not feasible to operate two of the largest pools in Canada with limited swimmers. The pools are expensive to fill, to operate, to staff, and they have a normal capacity that ranges from 1,500 to 2,000 people. With uncertainty on gathering size and the need to prepare the pools to open early, the option to keep the pools closed in 2021 is recommended. Allure Gorge was similar with their splash pad operational review, and the requirements to operate a single splash pad would make it very staff and regulation heavy 
and would be promoting an area where large groups again would congregate. And this is what we're trying to avoid. We will use this year to repair, patch, paint the pools for future operation. And we'll be mindful to keep the internal pumping systems operational through our regular maintenance. At Brant and Bing, we're also planning to increase overnight capacity camping tolerances as the day use activities are not as stressed in overall occupancy. Next slide. Tubing and the Allure Quarry. For tubing, we used a new registration system last year that was reservation based and it worked really, really well. It guaranteed a spot and a tube for people arriving to the, the gorge. The program works so well, we're gonna modify it and use it to help manage our visitation at the quarry. Spots will be controlled and entry will be controlled and in, in a controlled release so that we can maintain public health guidelines and not overwhelm the capacity of the quarry. The beach at the quarry is relatively small in compared to the large swimming area. And you'll see that in the bottom photo. And this requires our direct supervision to operate and to help maintain that physical distancing. Next slide. Visitation management. I've mentioned capacity plans a few times already and they are the backbone of our visitation management strategy. They help to quantify the number of parking spots available or guidelines for how many patrons in a park or a specific area like a beach. And they also help to determine what triggers visual inspections of our areas and to ultimately help support the largest decision of when to close a park due to too many people. Each day our security and our senior staff are out in the park monitoring people and how they use our space. For example, some days you get more visitors to the boat launch than to the beach or you'll have lots of walkers and hikers and no boat launch users. It's important that we understand where the people are going inside our conservation areas and how we can influence the use of the park by directing traffic in a different way or encouraging patrons to park at say the first parking lot rather than parking at the beach. Next slide. And staff and training support, one of the ways we've supported it was through our onboarding of our student staff. We've modified our training programs. We normally use a variety of training methods and now we're mostly offering virtual and live team training sessions. We've created on-site training sessions where necessary and things when they're needing to be explained to in-person, we're using smaller groups and creating more opportunities. We've made use of some great online resources and in-house presentations, things like our security guard training program. It uses live actor style scenarios as part of our training. And now they'll be completed in each park in separately smaller groups. Same training, it's just different. We've also created a schedule that allows for spaced out arrival and departures of staff, staggered lunch breaks for staff, ensuring that all staff have a dedicated lunch break and have some personal time to be outside, to eat, rest on their break, or even take their masks off if they desire. Another support is our continuous development of standard operating procedures that highlight working during a pandemic. And fortunately, the lessons we learned in 2020 are being applied for 2021. And we've had five months to review, to revisit, and update these staffing and operational plans. So we feel that we're in great shape for meeting the needs of this summer. Next slide. Here are just some examples of summer students donning their personal protective equipment and using safe procedures at work. Uh, we're happy to say that last year we were fortunate no one contracted COVID at work and that our protocols had a role to play, but I also believe it was our employee commitment to a safe work environment that helped. Uh, next slide. And memberships. This is an area that I'll be watching for the future this year. Sales of memberships have increased dramatically in the first quarter of 2021. Parks like Shades Mills in Cambridge have sold more memberships in the first three months than they sold all of last year. And last year was a good year for memberships. So they're a great value and they, they're essential for our loyal customers. They're their lifeline to local nature. Our capacity numbers though, they do dictate closures and those limits apply to everyone, even to our membership users. So this is, like I said, is an area that we're going to be keeping our eye on this year. Next slide. Ah, this is my long range forecast. 
We're hoping by the end of the season, we have a wonderful campsite with a tiny little happy customer there and everyone gets a chance to enjoy the conservation areas this summer. Thank you. All right, Pam, thank you very much. Boy, there's this COVID's keeping you guys hopping, eh? This is a real um, different way to run these parks. You're probably learning a lot of stuff too, right? That you can use going forward. So are there any comments or questions from the board? All right, seeing none. Well, thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'd like to thank Pam for all the work she's doing to ensure the safety of our residents in the watershed. It certainly is a lot more complicated to open a campground than we ever thought. And um, they're doing great work. And uh, I was happy to hear none of the employees uh, contracted um, the virus. So thank you. Thanks, Joan. And Richard? Thank you. Just one question. You're, are you doing the online registration at Brant Park? Uh, is there, will there be other options for, for registering if some folks don't have the online capabilities? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, we are offering that. So we're allowing people to call in. This is a pilot year. So we're doing some kind of modification um, starting at the beginning of April when reservations open, we'll have a customer service rep available at Brant Park and they can help uh, people who don't have access to a computer register and we'll walk people through it. We're not gonna turn somebody away because they can't register online. So we'll make it work. Is the payment online too then? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, and, and to echo Joan, the, one of the things we witnessed up here, the difficulty of closing these parks is, is problematic as well, right? Because the people can't get into the park, then they filter out into the municipality and you have all of those issues. So I think with the burgeoning population we're, we're going on up, up where we you know all live, um, the, these problems are gonna get worse and worse with the, with the green fields we have and with the park closures, because a lot of them are already pre-COVID, mm -hmm reaching capacities like Laura and Rockwood. And then when they can't get into the park, people don't know what to do. And it's, so that's some partnerships or something we're gonna have to discuss with specific municipalities to see how we can accommodate that. So I don't envy your task this summer. I know it's gonna be a tough one. I know you guys are, are working hard. So good luck with that. Uh, Bruce. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just had to get on muted. Uh, has there been any consideration of, of uh, having uh, rapid testing available or would that increase their capacity or what's the cost benefit of looking at some of that technology? Um, apparently it's out there, but I haven't heard of it being used very extensively yet. Is that apt to happen? So I'll, I'll try to take this. I, I think that that would probably be a little bit outside our purview. You're, you're venturing off into the Board of Health and various things. I don't know what the liabilities are, what the tests are. You'd have to have staff. You'd have to have them trained. You'd have like it. Yeah, I appreciate the thought, but I don't know that that's something the GRCA could necessarily step into at this point. And, and then you got to get the test back. I mean, that's a whole different. Go ahead, Sue. Uh, thank you. Yes, actually, um, Boards of Health and the province are looking at rapid testing for uh, workers that are um, meeting and dealing with the public. So we have to keep our eyes open for any word from the province or the Board of Health uh, on the availability of that and how that will happen. I don't know if they send the test kits to the businesses or what. So yeah, it's in the works, actually. I think it's going to happen fairly soon. So, so I may have been confused, Bruce. I, I, I didn't know if you meant rapid testing for the employees, which is one thing. And, and you know, that's something we can look at. Rapid testing for the visitors to the park is probably a, a non-starter. I'm sorry. I misinterpreted. If you're talking staff only, yeah, we'll see what comes out of the out of the delegations. But did I yeah. misinterpret? Well, not not completely, Mr. Chair. But I just wondered uh, with that technology, e even if our staff that are in the park or monitoring the park, if they see somebody that looks suspicious, what what do they do? Is there do they send them to a health department, or do <laughs> we do we have any role there at all? I, I don't know that we would have the authority to do that. Plus, I, I got to believe that the people would have to be absolutely trained. You go up and accuse somebody of something and you're not trained, you know, we could end up in lawsuits. I hear what you're trying to say, but I think that the parks need to continue doing the safety measures that they're doing 
and keeping keeping all those protocols in place. And beyond maybe rapid testing for the staff, I don't know that we could become, uh, you know what, in a, in a worst case scenario, if there were concerns, I guess if there was some big thing that staff could contact the police, but I don't think that we could be COVID enforcers. I think that would be a difficult road. I don't know, that's just my thought. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Are there any other uh, comments or questions? Uh, Ian? Uh, thank you, Chairman White. Um, Pam, uh, will all the um, outhouses in the Gorge Park be open now? I know that they will be phasing in some sections, so not all outhouses may be opened. Um, certainly the ones that directly affect camping and camping areas. So if we're going to be opening up tent camping in this section, we'll make sure we have an outhouse open there. But I'm not sure if all of the outhouses will make it open this year. I'm just thinking with people hiking through the Gorge Park, knowing that there'll be a few more places they can stop at is great. Sure. And great news about the uh, quarry being open this year too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, if there's nothing further, Pam, thanks. Great presentation and we look forward to a fun summer for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, moving right along to the first and second reading of the bylaws. Uh, we have a presentation from Karen about the uh, CA changes. This is a pretty hefty little document. So Karen, I'm just gonna turn it over to you if that's all right. For 12.1. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just pulling out another presentation. Okay, so uh, I, I apologize in advance. This is the only picture in this presentation, so it's not quite as uh, aesthetically pleasing as the conservationary presentation that Pam just went through. Uh, a number of changes have been proclaimed um, in the Conservation Authorities Act. Some of them are being incorporated into the draft bylaw that's before you today. And uh, this is a summary. So I'll just walk through the changes that have been proclaimed. Um, so that in the date enforced for most of them are February 2nd. There's one that you'll notice we go through that was December. Um, and I'll speak to that when we get to it. So the first one is uh, inclusion of an Aboriginal treaty rights non-derogation or non-abrogation clause, basically saying that the Conservation Authorities Act cannot override any other Aboriginal rights um, that, that exist under other legislation. So there's no action required on that one. Um, that's the second one here about municipal appointments. Uh, we've spoken about this before for the board, at least 70% of the municipality's appointees are required to be selected from their municipal councillors. Um, they have created a process where municipalities can apply to the minister to have that percentage modified. The decision is at the minister's discretion and may include conditions or restrictions. I've included in the package um, the, the questions that they're looking to have answered. We will include information when we send out reminders to municipalities about um, appointments when it comes time for appointments of members. Current members can complete their remain, the remaining duration of their appointment and then as new members are appointed so um for so Karen, one, we're getting sorry Karen we're getting a bit of an echo um is there a computer something we could turn off or uh well we actually only have the one my sound is off on my laptop so okay I'm not sure what that is okay take off your camera it may help sorry yeah yeah you shut your camera down that might I don't, my camera on my computer? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I don't have it on. Okay. Anyway, I, I, I think we're okay. It's just, it's, anyway, carry on. Okay. Um, then the number of members. So currently we have an order in council that specifies how, how we appoint members, the number of members per municipality, and that is separate from the population formula that is under the Conservation Authorities Act. And we are required to co uh, provide a copy of that to the minister by April 3rd and, and post that to the website. So we plan to send that after the meeting today, a copy of the order in council. Some of the municipalities that are listed in order in council are somewhat dated because it is from uh, 1994, 1996. Sorry, I apologize. I don't remember the exact year. So uh, we are providing information about what those municipalities have become to date. So we will advise them of that. There is the introduction of the, the member from an agricultural sector. 
agricultural sector who can be appointed. So there is no action at this time that hasn't happened yet at the Grand River Conservation Authority. In the event that that happens, we will orient the new member and deal with that accordingly. There are some limitations on the voting powers of that representative. They've added wording with respect to agenda and minutes that uh, meeting agendas have to be made available to the public before a meeting takes place. We already do that. Um, the second one that minutes are to be available to the public within 30 days following a meeting. We have not done that previously within 30 days. We typically would do that following the, the subsequent meeting where they are approved. So we are going to post them in the agenda package now and we'll note them as draft. So we've updated that in the bylaw. Uh, this is one that discussion or discussion is required, I believe. Um, the, there are they're introducing limits on terms for the chair and vice chair. Um, so office for a term of one year. So that's currently our practice. However, they're now instituting um, no serve for no more than two consecutive terms, so two years. And that appointments have to rotate amongst participating municipalities. So a member from a specific municipality can't be selected to succeed an outgoing chair or vice chair appointed by the same municipality. Uh, requests for exceptions to this may be made to the minister. So um, in the bylaw, the draft bylaw before you today, we've updated it to reference the no, no more than two consecutive terms, recognizing that the board may want to have discussion on this and apply to the minister for an exception. With respect to powers of authorities, they updated the wording, um, just integrating research with the power to study and investigate. It used to be its own term and to require consent of the occupant or owner of land before CA staff can enter land. This was already our practice and remove the power for a conservation authority to expropriate land. So the bylaw has been updated to incorporate this change because we do reference the powers of authorities right now. Uh, the next one is the minister's power um, to appoint an investigator of a conservation authority and similarly to appoint a temporary administrator. So there's no action required on this at the time, but um, certainly we would provide additional information in the event that that happens. I would imagine that there would be some precipitating events before it got to that point that we would be discussing. Uh, this next one was um, proclaimed on December 8th, 2020, and this is about permission for development and the zoning order. So um, the Minister's zoning order was previously discussed, and then the second part is about um, the applicant being given the opportunity to be heard by the authority in a hearing for conditions attached to a permission, so the bylaw has been modified accordingly. I already mentioned that the um, act has been updated to remove the ability to expropriate lands, uh, so the CAs could request that from the municipality or the province, but we no longer have that direct ability. And the, there's um, a new section 36.1 that the minister may uh, delegate powers to an employee in the ministry. So there's no action required on our part. And with respect to the audit, just that conservation authorities must follow uh, generally accepted accounting principles for local government under the public sector accounting board, PSAB, and ensure that key documents are made public. So we are in compliance with this. And wording has been updated in the bylaw. Another uh, couple of points here that they had previously referenced that they were adding um, a change to the duty of a member, that it was going to be changed to act uh, with a view to furthering the objects, um, sorry, to change it from the act with a view to furthering the objects of the authority to act on behalf of their respective municipality, because that, that was not enacted. So the, the current wording where the objects of the authority are the duty of the member remains in place. And there are a number of additional changes that were introduced that are to be proclaimed at a later date, such as specifying the mandatory programs and services, a transition plan with dates, fee policies, uh, and the levy regulation and other regulations. So um, with respect to the report before you, it's on page 12. There is a chart that identifies the specific changes um, that are in the constitution, sorry, in the bylaw, have been made to the bylaw. Um, most of them are driven by the Conservation Authorities Act changes. However, uh, we also introduced wording that about what, that we are webcasting the meetings um, and that they will be available for later viewing. Currently, that's not the case. So we just wanted to be clear that we'll post those to the website for public access after the meetings as well. And 
That's All right, it. we thought, sorry? Sorry, that's it for me, Mr. Chair. Okay, we thought the parks were having fun. Okay, um, <laughs> any uh, comments or questions from the board? There's a lot in there. Bernie? Thank you very much. I sent out a notice, uh, notice of information to the uh, board that I had concern with the items that are listed in, in section 17, the term limits. I find that when you're a chairman of something, it usually takes you a couple of years to get involved. They're too restrictive. And I wonder what the history and the initiative is behind this representation from each municipality and how it's going to be rolled out. I take, for example, there are a lot of good members from the region of Waterloo, but my understanding of what is being said is that you can only have one from that and then it rotates. And I have difficulty with that. Perhaps I can get some more members' views on that. I don't know whether there's anything you can do about it, but I find it uh, micromanaging and too restrictive. Okay, so just so we're clear on what I think Bernie's putting on the table here. One is the term of the chair and the vice chair. Right now we have annual elections and we had a five-year term if you survive and they've cut that back to two years. And I know, and I, you know, it's a bit of a, sitting in the chair, it's awkward for me to talk about this, but I could say other conservations are looking at trying to get amendment to that too. My understanding is there were some conservations that were having difficulties with their chairs. They couldn't remove, I, I have no idea how this worked, but they couldn't get them out or they couldn't rotate them or they had complaints from other municipalities that a certain municipality was dominating the chair. So they're almost two different things. So I think Bernie's correct in terms of the, the shorter term. It, anybody who's sat in a mayor's seat or any of these scenarios knows it takes a while to figure out what's going on. And conservation areas are pretty complicated now. With regards to the rotation, and tell me if I've got this wrong, it seems a little ridiculous to me that I, I think we got 38 municipalities, but what have we got, 20 to assess paying or, or whatever that is? You've got to roll through. So if, uh, if the region had the chair today, you've got to roll through all 22 municipalities before you can have it again, if I've got that correct. You're talking, you're talking almost as long as Hazel mccallion has been a mayor. So it'd be very difficult to, uh, and so that's, so the idea would be that we would ask for um, an amendment to maybe move the chair and vice chair of term up and, and, and get some relief on the rotation and give them some ideas. Maybe it's that the current uh, municipality can't immediately take the chair or something like that, a little more reasonable. So I think that's what's on the floor. Any thoughts? Bruce? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my, my take uh, was not quite the same as yours, Chris, on having to move through every municipality. It was, I, at least the way I read it, it, it couldn't be the same municipality year after year. They could maybe come back in after year two or whatever. But anyway, that's, that's not the main point. I agree with you that uh, it takes a while to, to kind of feel comfortable in that position. I think the fact that there'd no longer be a chance to have continuity over an election uh, of municipal representation uh, I think that was a great idea to have that term for five years. But when my question would be, when do we start asking for exemptions? Because the way I understand this in terms of, of board members, the only ones that could, could actually elect a member at large, or the only one would be the region of Waterloo, because no one else has more than two representatives and we can't allocate a, a percentage of a, a person. And so if, if all of our municipalities, if they want to have a non-elected representative, they'd all have to make an application, is my understanding. Now, are we going to, are we going to analyze this and, and then uh, send some recommendations to the government with our suggestions, or how are we going to proceed? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll get to everybody in a minute. I think the idea here would be to see what the board has to say today, and then... Um, uh, have the staff go back and look at it and come forward and get absolute clarity. I just want to get, am I, I'm sorry, Karen or, or Sam, can you, can we get the, the clarity on this rotation? If there is any, is it everybody goes through or 
So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, just to clarify a couple of points, the, the one with respect to the 70% being municipal councillors, that request has to be made by the municipalities um, as opposed to the conservation authority because the municipalities choose who they appoint. And then the chair and vice chair in the term um, and any exceptions to that, that is to be made, by, that request is to be made by the conservation authority. Now the wording, it, it does say specifically an authority in respect of which more than one participating municipality has been designated, blah, blah, blah. Uh, basically appointing chair and vice chair on a rotating basis on, so as to ensure that a member appointed to the authority by a particular participating municipality cannot be appointed to succeed an outgoing chair or vice chair appointed to the authority by the same participating municipality. So it says rotating, however, it does reference succeeding. So you could argue, I suppose, it would be every other time that they would be eligible. So Sam does meet with the, the province. I don't know if there's been any discussion on this. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair. Conservation Ontario and some of the other um, CAs are also grappling with the interpretation and intention of what um, MECP meant by some of these conditions. So at this point in time, the way that um, I guess collectively is that there is there has to be a full rotation of all the participating. But I believe that that's one of the points that um, Conservation Ontario is seeking legal advice on in terms of the interpretation of that. So like a lot of this stuff, there, there's ambiguity. They say this, it means that, like there's so much in here. And I think part of the thought would be if we do go back and have staff take a look at this, we would also wait till the dust kind of settles, right? Because we still don't have the mandate and the regs. So if we were going to approach the government, we want to know with clarity exactly where they think they finally landed. And then we could decide what we might want to do going forward. Anybody else want to comment? Alex? Chris, can you see, hand, are we raising our hands or? What yeah, if you could, I'm sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Okay. No, well, uh, Helen's has her hand up and John has, and I have. Yeah, one. I was going to get to John. I, or no? Yeah, I am. Sorry, oh. Jeff. Go ahead. Actually, John was first. Go ahead, John. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I support the, the comments that you made about where we are in the process. Uh, and, I, and I think that this probably should be referred back to staff based on some of the comments that are made by the board today to come back with uh, a report that we sent to the minister asking for uh, specific things around what has been identified as an issue and that is uh, the term of, of, uh, of chairman and vice chairman. But I also think, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, we need to also offer a solution to the government in terms of how we're gonna manage it. So for example, if we're looking for an exemption for the terms of, of chair and vice chair, then you know, how are we going to manage that? Because, you know, the reason why this, this change was made, because there is a very real problem in some conservation authorities with succession. And that's what was, that's what was being responded to here. And so, you know, for example, if we said, okay, we're going to have, we may have a chair who serves for four or five years, but there's going to be a, you know, an annual vote as to whether that, whether or not that chairman or chairwoman continues for, to the, for the next year. And if that's if that's codified, then perhaps we've resolved the issue to the to uh, the satisfaction of the government. But um, I agree with we, with your comments. But I think let's put it back to staff to have them come back based on what uh, uh, direction has been given to them today. Yeah, and and I think that that annual election is one of those things that should filter out if you have a chair that's not functioning. So that's what confuses me about these places that have difficulties with their chairs. And we do have to. And I, I've got a list of folks here. I, I see the names. We do have to keep in mind that staff um, are, can go out and do an analysis, but they need to be careful in terms of what recommendations they give because you don't want to get into a conflict of them trying to indirectly, someone says they're dictating how they're being governed. I know that might be a stretch, but we, we'll just need to be careful how that report comes through. So next I had, um, apologies here, Helen. We can't hear you. Well, this, sorry, happens all the time with this thing. Uh, sorry about that, uh, Chair White. Uh, what I would uh, suggest is that we recognize it is an absolute conflict of interest for staff to create a report on how they are governed. Uh, so um, I think we have to find our way through the interpretation. What we can ask staff to do is clarify the interpretation of the policy 
but we can't ask them to make recommendations on how they are governed. Um, another point I wanted to make that was um, that I feel is important is uh, as past chair, and I'm sure uh, Jane Mitchell could probably comment on this as well. Even though we do not operationally interfere with the organization, governing such a technical organization uh, from an from a technical, from many technical perspectives, actually, uh, politically, so many municipalities and managing so many different stakeholders. Uh, this is not a this is not a quick and easy learning curve, uh, in my opinion. And so I I do think that we have to um, really uh, approach this particular tenure issue with some good common sense. And I don't know, maybe there's an option for us to ask for an exemption from this based on our specific circumstances that would roll out for 20 years or something, if that's what pleases this, this, you know, this particular policy, uh, you know, because they have said, you know, you can ask for exemptions. Well, maybe we do ask for an exemption and maybe it's a long-term exemption if that's the case. So I just kind of wanted to speak to the fact that I'd be very concerned uh, over, you know, a term of only two years. I recognize we have the, benefit of an annual election. So if we had sort of a, a quasi not great chair, the option is there with us from a democratic perspective. And I'd be really concerned about um, a rotational um, uh, policy in that it kind of undermines democracy. So um, so just my two cents there, I, I, hope, I hope I've articulated uh, that um, well enough. Thanks, Helen. I think those are some good points. Jeff? Oh, man, where do you start on this stuff? Um, <laughs> honestly, I, it, it, you know, this is, in my mind, this is so uh, stupid. You know, you paint everybody with the same brush. Um, we have a unique situation here, and it's almost like if we follow through on, on what's being discussed, we almost pit municipality against municipality. We pit uh, appointees against municipal appointees. It's ridiculous. It really is. So I think we, I, I agree with Helen. I think we should be asking for an exemption, but I think we also should be asking for some clarity. And maybe uh, maybe the conservation authorities should be starting to uh, write how um, MPPs get elected. And we might uh. see some, some different things happening. Now, honestly, this is crazy. So I, I you know, uh, the, the chair makes, I don't know, was it 23,000, Chris, or 20 grand or whatever? That's probably mo more than what most of the municipal uh, representatives make on, on, uh, on, on the GRCA, I suspect. Um, and some of us have full-time jobs. So how do you expect an elected official who is a farmer or has another uh, 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 employment somewhere else and, and really does the, the, the council part as a part-time gig, how, how are they supposed to be able to, to do all of that? I think um, my view has always been, you look for someone that is qualified, that has the time to do it and to do the job properly. You look at the chair's description, I think every chair we've had in the past has gone way above and beyond the call of what that description says. You know, I know Helen. Helen's was in the office on basically on a daily basis. She went to all of the foundation meetings, you know, meeting with staff and and trying to give uh, uh, advice and all of those things. So if we create a chair that's basically just someone that's going to be there for a year, who, who's going to put their heart and soul into it? I just don't see this. I think it's ridiculous, you know. And I've always been a firm believer that people, especially ratepayers that pay the freight, should have that kind of representation. And I think we've had a good, good balance on, on this board. And these are how wars start in other, in other parts of the world. You know, people are supposed to be able to work together and we do. So why is this government trying to divide us? So I think an exemption is, is certainly in order and uh, maybe a, a, a trip for all of us to go up to Queens Park because uh, honestly, with all due respect, this is stupid. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Richard? Um, thank you for that, Jeff. I love it when you get fired up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, the exemption is, is, is in order, but I, here's the, the exemption I would suggest, that we have an exemption that, uh, kind of like John said, but for a four-year term to be coincide with the term of municipal councils and, and municipal elections, so that the term of the chair could be up to four years 
uh, and the phrase could be up to four years and to be reconfirmed on an annual basis. And that will solve, I think, the problem of those smaller uh, conservation authorities where they can't seem to uh, vote a chair out because they're in for the term of five years. Uh, the rotation system, I don't think is a problem. I think we're reading it wrong. I, I think they just don't want to, they want to make sure that uh, one municipality uh, doesn't man uh, manipulate the chair by going back and forth and back and forth. We'll get clarification of that, but I'm, I'm quite sure. Because uh, I can't imagine everybody that uh, signs on to, uh, to be a member of the Conservation Authority as a, from their municipality wants to be chair or even would be qualified to be chair, quite frankly. Uh, so, or put the time in as Jeff has quite so eloquently said uh, from our past chair. So we, we elect chairs that do a fantastic job. We know we're gonna do a fantastic job and that's why our authority has been so successful. So I would agree with the uh, making amendments and requesting those amendments uh, and, and clarification, but uh, the, the chair clarification, one year, two years, two years is not even enough. I mean, I served on the Children's Aid Society at, Took me almost five years just to learn the legislation and the requirements just to get to make good decisions. So uh, there's ours is the same. You know, maybe some smaller uh, conservation authorities could manage that, but you know, we're one of the largest in the province and one of the best run in the province. So I, I, I would agree with the comments. Thank you. All right, thank you. So and just before I get to Sue, just so I think we get a little bit of clarity. So I think hearing Helen's points and everybody's point here, I think a couple things we could do is one, we'll get clarity as best we can. And that's a reasonable ask of staff. Secondarily, maybe we can touch base with some other CAs and see what kind of exemptions that they're looking for. Because I've spoken to the chair of the Hamilton Conservation and so forth. We're not alone. I think they're getting inundated with this. It's in fact, if you that's a, the original iteration of this legislation didn't even have an exemption clause. And I think they got so hammered that they brought that in. So I think if the staff can put something together and then maybe the, the two past chairs can put together a couple of recommendations or something that comes from them as opposed to staff. But uh, maybe the first step is get clarity from staff next month around what, how we interpret this. And then if, if the board is okay, there's, it's probably gonna be fairly simple once we see how it's laid out, the exemption we're looking for, but maybe we could have the past chairs craft it so we don't have the, the governance concerns. Uh, okay, Sue? I was gonna say that staff don't necessarily have a conflict of interest if they provide the board with the information and the board also sends in some comments to the province on the suggested changes, then it, the staff is just providing us with clarification so that we can create the comments and state why we think governance should be A, B, C, D. And um, then we're not stepping on any grounds. We're just asking class for, uh, staff for clarification. Staff can also, when they do the reports coming to the governance sections, refer back to the board's document on how governance, how they wish to proceed with governance. Therefore, there's no conflict of interest anywhere. Okay. Um, am I missing any hands? Is there any? Uh, Jane, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, talk about this since I was part of the committee that actually brought in the five-year term limit. And before that, there were two chairs, a couple of chairs that went on for many, many years. And then we had Alan Dale who had four years, and then I believe me. But anyway, um, we decided on five years because four years is the term of a municipality. And then the extra year was when, the, when it changes, you had somebody experienced at the top when there's the change and there's a lot of more municipal councillors and different people coming in to just help them through that first year. So that's that was our reasoning and, and I, I feel it works really well. I I think the five years is, is great. I also think having an election every year while it's hair raising for the chair themselves, for everybody else it's good. Then if you have a chair that you don't feel is doing a good job, then you bump them out, you know, so that's that's how it works and uh, certainly i found it good thanks jane bob thanks chris so the only issue i have is the terms as well um i think it's it's a good idea to have term limits and i think you know that five could be four and i think uh a two plus two rather than having an election every year, it's every two years. 
Um, and I, I think that we should ask for an exemption somewhere in there. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Uh, Bruce. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. The, and this, um, I'm not sure if I speak on behalf of the other farmers that have to sit on the, the conservation authority or GRCA board, but I, I think a token agriculture representative on the board is, is nonsense. We, we represent a big enough agricultural area that there are farmers that sit on council through our, the watershed and the, the whole issue of whether you're an elected official or not, I found while I was an elected official, sometimes you didn't have enough time to, to work something else or representation on another board into your schedule. And, and the other thing was a lot of them had, don't really have an interest in conservation authority. I think they should, but a lot of, of elected officials do not have the same interest as some representatives representatives at large. So I, I don't know where you go with this, but uh, if we have to have all but one of our municipalities apply for an exemption so they can have a non-elected representative on the GRCA board, it's, it's kind of foolish if, if that desire is there to even um, have a, a representative that's not elected in, in the municipality. I don't know if we have to run this by all those municipalities, but my read of it, the only one that could appoint a non-elected member without an exemption would be the region of Waterloo. Okay, um, thanks, Bruce. I don't know if we wanna try to get some clarity around that or what we could do is pile that in with everything else we're trying to get clarity on next time. Uh, Les, did you wanna, oh, sorry, go ahead, Karen. No, I was just going to alert you to- uh... Les? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Um, I, I just thought I'd like to end this with saying that too bad we can't ask for an exemption from silliness. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? We always could. Um, but see, but be careful what you wish for. Okay. So, so I think the direction from the board is to go out and get clarity on a couple of these points, maybe touch base with some other CAs, bring it back, and then we'll figure out how we can craft what we might like to see as an exemption. All right, okay, so that's it for that item. So um, that's it for 12-1, correct? I'm going to read a motion here. I have a motion uh, that bylaw 12, uh, 1 2021 be read a first, second, and third time and adopted by the general membership to take effect on March 26, 2021. And that bylaw 3 2020 be repealed on March 26, 2021 that a copy of bylaw 1 2021 be forwarded to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks and posted publicly on the Grand River Conservation Authority website. Is there anything further? Can I get a mover for that? Moved by John, second by Les. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving along to more general items here, 12.2, cash and investment status. Motion that report number GM 032120 cash and investment status February 2021 be received as information. Moved by Sue, seconded by Ian. Any opposed? Thank you, carried. Now we're on to the financial summary. And I think Sonia has a little, a uh, couple of words she'd like to pass on to us and then we'll get to the motion. Am I correct? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, there you are. Hi, Sonia. <laughs> Floor's yours. Okay, I believe uh, Karen asked if I would just maybe uh, speak to the status of the CHOOSE grant, the CEWS, that um, was part of our audited statements. Uh, just wish to report that we put in claims for 2020 almost uh, totaling $3.1 million. We have received the funding. Uh, the claim application form though is very simple. It's just basically put in your amount and your payroll. So it doesn't make any challenges. Uh, we understand some other authorities are being contacted by CRA and they're being challenged as to their eligibility as to um, the public institution criteria. So we have not heard from CRA We've got the money, we've put it in a reserve, uh, or we would put it in a reserve. We are not 
spending it in case it is clawed back by the government. So um, no definitive. So just clarity, sorry for the board members and some of us who may or may not know, can you just explain what the grant is? Uh, the grant is equal to a certain percentage of your salary, of your compensation, your pay, can be sometimes up to 75% of a person's pay. Um, it uh, has, to, in order to be, and that 75% uh, was on a sliding scale over the years, and it gets quite involved on how they calculate that percentage, but it's being reimbursed for some of your compensation. Uh, the other criteria in terms of how much you get is a function of your revenues and by how much they have uh, declined when compared to prior years. And again, it's quite complex on which months you compare to what. So it gets involved and we did hire KPMG to do all the uh, calculations for us. So we'll get some of our compensation refunded. So to net it out, it was a wage sub subsidy from the wage feds. Subsidy. Correct. And at the end of the day, the feds have decided that CAs or CRA has decided that we're not, doesn't apply to us. So we're going to challenge that, I think. They Correct? haven't told us that specifically, but they've okay. told some, a couple other CAs. So we okay. anticipate it. Anyway, stay tuned for that one. I, before we move on, does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Thank you, Sonia. Appreciate it. You're so welcome. I have a financial summary. I have a motion that the financial summary for the period ending February 28th, 2021 be approved. <clears throat> Can I get a mover please, Jeff? And Sue, uh, questions? John. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you. I just wanna know from, uh, from uh, Sam or Karen, uh, what their sense is financially as we're, as we're going through uh, this first quarter relative to last year, relative to uh, what we know now about uh, uh, what is taking place uh, in, in uh, our <laughs> business. And, uh, and what we anticipate our outlook is uh, going forward. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, I'd actually ask Sonia to speak to that question if she can. Okay, Mr. Chair. Uh, we are doing more on par with where we were at in 2019 uh, as opposed to COVID. We are doing quite well. The, with the exception of our Nature Center program, it is not up to the same type of speed and activity that we had prior to COVID. Uh, properties okay, the, as Pam mentioned, the parks was the other big area that was to be hit, that was hit by COVID last year, but it's doing better. And um, the other area that was hit by COVID last year was the forestry program, but we totally canceled the spring planting, but we are um, proceeding with that this year. So it's back on track. And we had expected some activity with planning last year that did not materialize. We actually did higher than last year and our levels have not dropped off this year for planning fees revenue either. So we're looking good. I think a lot of folks are surprised at where we've actually ended up some of the municipalities and counties and stuff at the beginning of this, there was a bit of a concern, almost a panic. And yet, you know what? A lot of us have come, come right through it and I think We've seen a little bit of that here. Is there any further questions or comments on the financials? I don't see any hands. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, somebody, okay. Thanks, Sonia. Okay. Replacement compact backhoe and tractor purchase. Now some exciting stuff. I have a motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority purchase 12021 JCB 3CX compact backhoe loader from Advanced Construction Equipment Limited in the amount of $110,000, excluding HSD, and 1-2021 John Deere 405-2R four-wheel drive tractor with a cab and front loader from Premier Equipment Limited in the amount of $61,185.72, excluding HSD. Can I get a mover for that? And then I'll go for questions. Moved by Richard, seconded by Bruce. Any questions on this? Any opposed? Oh, sorry, Bernie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm concerned that we've had uh, 11 uh, people take out the specs and only one uh, put forward a, a proposal. And I'm wondering if our, our, our 
qualifications are too restrictive uh, and would seem to favor a local bidder. Is that the view I take or 11, one bid, you know, 10% for uh, location of parts, et cetera, is $10,000 if somebody can, can get in on that. Just from an explanation how fair the system is. Okay, who, who wants that? I would like to ask Brandon to speak to the process if he's able to join the call. Yes, thank you. Um, so through you, Chair, um, I think we might be confusing the report. So the 11, the 11 downloaders had to do with the uh, road surface treatment tender. Um, so that was where we have noted that there were 11 registered document takers, but only one bid was received. Um, so for the tractor purchase, we didn't have that same response. Um, so we did a public, um, a public procurement through Bid and Go, and only one bid was received for the backhoe loader with integrated cab. Can I do it for you, Bernie? Yeah, thanks for that clarification. I'm just wondering with that uh, type of machinery, why we would only get uh, one bid on it, and I, I understand with regard to the... Uh, the work on maintenance on the roads, but I still don't understand. It's a specialty, but I know we got people all over Ontario provide that type of maintenance. It's a concern. All right, thank you, Bernie. Uh, Richard, did you want to say something or are you just moving the motion? Just moving the motion. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions on this then? Okay, any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving along to replacement truck and purchase. Motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority purchase one 2021 Dodge Ram 1500 pickup truck from Blue Mountain Chrysler in the amount of $31,896, excluding HSD, one 2021 Chevrolet Silverado 2500 pickup truck from Schreier Chevrolet in the amount of $42,741.55, excluding HST, and one 2021 Chevrolet uh, Silverado 3,500 pickup truck from Schrader Chevrolet in the amount of $45,029.45, excluding HSD. Can I get a mover for that? Moved by Joan, seconded by Ian. Any comments or questions? Any opposed? We've just bought a new fleet, that's carried. Moving along to the 2021 road surface treatment. Motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority award the tender for the 2021 road surface treatments to Cornell Construction Limited of Brantford, Ontario, up to the amount of $265,100, excluding HST, and then a total budget project of $292,000, excluding HST, be approved. Uh, mover, please. Moved by Sue, seconded by Jeff. Comments, questions? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. And we've got a, another presentation here from Fred on development interference with wetlands and alterations. Fred, if I'm correct. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hopefully, yours, sir. hopefully you can hear me. I just need to get my share screen thing happening. I can do that, Fred, if you'd like, or would you prefer to control it? Um, either way, either way. Um, yeah. Did that come up? If not, you can go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so. What we have before you today is one of our permit applications. Um, those of you who have been on the board for a while recognize you don't often see our, our permitting process. Uh, historically, all of the permits went to the board. However, um, as a result of some changes a few years back, staff were delegated the ability to issue permits uh, where the permit met all of the policies that were approved by the membership for use by staff. So what we have before you today is a permit that does not actually conform to the policy. Um, there's a bit of a policy gap is what we found um, through our review of this particular application. So with that, we are going to present it to the board members. The board members today have the opportunity to approve this, in which case staff would issue the permit. Or if the board feels that, um, that it is not in the interest of the authority to issue this particular permit, 
they have the uh, ability to defer it for a full hearing. So those are your choices today. Just thought I'd go over that as a preliminary, if that's all right, Chair. Certainly. So before you, you have a permit application 188-20 Riverview Heights, and it's, uh, it's actually located on Mile Hill in uh, Brant, and I'm not sure whether I'm... Uh, could you advance the slide, Karen, please? Thank you. So the location, and this is kind of rough, um, but it shows that it is on the west side of Paris and it's on Mile Hill. And again, uh, if you could advance, please. Thank you. So here we have an air photo showing the subject property. The subject property is set well back from the river. The permit before you is for construction of a dwelling and the um, mapping that we have has identified these lands as being subject to a riverine erosion hazard. Uh, what we found through, through the study uh, that was submitted by the applicant is that this site has a steep but stable slope, which is not subject to the tow erosion. I would add at this point that um, the subject property is um, fully serviced. There are municipal services on the road in front of the lot itself. So, um, it's not a case of a, of a well or a septic system being considered at this point. So a permit has been submitted to the GRCA for the construction of the dwelling. And the policy document that was approved for use by SAF does not include policies that consider development within the riverine erosion hazard uh, using site-specific criteria. So there's no provision for a site assessment of the hazard. In this case, the applicant had provided the... Uh, put in the application because it is within the regulated area. Um, if I could get the next slide, please, Karen. Thank you. And as you can see, there's lots of bright yellow there. And that indicates on our mapping that we're within an erosion hazard. So the erosion hazard that we look at um, is either tow erosion, that is from the river. In this case, it's set well back from the river and well back from the floodplain, or surficial erosion where the slope itself um, can slide down or rotational where the slope would fail and things would rotate or, or transpose down the slope itself. For this permit, the applicant had provided a full geotechnical assessment and it has gone back and forth with our engineering staff and they are satisfied that um, in fact, this is a steep but stable slope. And um, because of the way the mapping is and the way our policies are, are structured, um, they, the, we don't have that as one of the criteria that we can apply to this particular circumstance. So in this case, you're, being, you're considering the permit because it's not covered by an approved authority policy, has factors in addition to the policy consideration which should be considered, or it precedes a decision of settlement of a legal proceeding or tribunal. In this case, what we're suggesting is that this is not directly covered by an approved authority policy. So the site considerations, um, if you could proceed one more, please, Karen. Thank you. So this is a cross section which shows as a result of boreholes, what the, um, the type of material is in the slope itself. And um, they've done a complete analysis. Uh, Chung and Vander Dolan Engineering, who are geotechnical engineers, did the study. So the land uh, that we had mapped as, as an erosion hazard, and our criteria for erosion hazard is a five horizontal to one vertical. And that's done through um, just strictly on mapping and does not take into account the nature of the material, uh, you know, whether it's a clay or a rock or a soil. So for example, up around Alora Gorge, our erosion hazard is quite extensive, even though we're on bedrock. Um, it's just a mapping exercise, which identifies an area that needs further investigation. This particular study, Slope Stability Assessment Proposed Residence, 187 Mile Hill Road, prepared by Chung and Vander Dolan, did look at all of those factors. There are some retaining walls proposed to create steps in the slope to allow for the development and, uh, and to prevent surficial slippage of the slope. Now we recognize that those have not been designed yet. Um, the detailed design has not been undertaken for the house and the grading around the house at this point. So that's why we're suggesting that it could be approved, but if it is approved, it needs to have that condition of, uh, of detailed design by a competent 
professional engineers who are familiar with slope stability. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. Thank you. So this is the site plan as presented. Um, it's a very busy little um, sheet, um, but that's what came in with the proposal. Uh, you can see Mile Hill Road at the bottom. There would be a driveway going up to a house, uh, sort of a T in the driveway, and then the house off to the left. And there are a couple of uh, terraces that create some level space for amenity areas associated with the house. The uh, top right shows a bit of a retaining wall structure. Uh, it's not really there for the overall slope stability. It uh, provides for some landscaping elements associated with the house and design. So our policy considerations, when we uh, uh, received the report and had worked through it, uh, we recognized that it didn't conform specifically with any of the policies approved for staff. So we went back to first principles and our first principle is that we are going to try to um, prevent uh, development that may be subject to uh, risk to life property. Um, so we went back to our earlier sections in the policy uh, in the section seven where the, um, where the general provisions of the policy are. And we've listed in the report, all of the considerations. I'm not gonna go through them in detail unless there's a question but uh, going through A through H, all of the different criteria that we looked at in our consideration for this permit. So our conclusion, we realized that we didn't really have a reason for refusal. And we concluded that the proposal addresses the intent of the policy section 8.2 and meets our general policy 7.1.2 specifically, that the risk to public safety is not increased, nor is the susceptibility to natural hazards increased or new hazards created provided that the final design is in accordance with the preliminary report that we received. So at this point, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is uh, going back, looking at our mapping criteria. Uh, is it appropriate? Is it still valid? Um, that's gonna be a, a big project. Uh, the other is that recognizing that the policies likely need a review as well. Um, go back and look, this is a, a I think the policies are in good shape. We don't have these very often, but uh, if, if there is a policy gap, we should be addressing that. So Karen, if you could proceed, please. Thank you. So this is just a cross section. The top line, which is a straight line, shows the stable angle and the bottom line shows the actual contouring. And uh, with the actual line being below the top line, it appears to be, uh, according to Chung and Vanderdolen, a reasonable proposal. So with the last slide, I will come to our conclusions. And if you could proceed, Karen. So our recommendation is that uh, the GRCA approve the permit application 18820 by Riverview Heights uh, with two conditions, the, sub the submission and approval of final plans to the satisfaction of the GRCA staff and that the retaining walls be designed and installed by qualified professionals as indicated in the slope stability assessment report prepared by Chung and Vanderdolen Engineering Limited. These conditions have been discussed with the applicant. The applicant is amenable to the conditions being applied if the permission is granted. Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to you if there are any questions. Uh Hey, Owen, can you let um, Chris back in? He's in the waiting room. I don't, sorry, I don't see him in the waiting room. I'm keeping my eye on it, but I, I don't see him there now. Okay. I guess that means I step up into the chair until he's uh, here, so. Um, Please. Is there any motion on this uh, issue? Uh, I see Richard has his hand up. I'll move the recommendation on the floor. And uh, I have Bob as the seconder. Anyone opposed? You're opposed, Bruce, or you want to comment? Actually, uh, I had a question uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, 
a temporary chair. I'm not sure just what you are, but you're chairing. And, a temporary chair, chair, but just, you know, uh, just call it, me Stu. Go ahead. Yeah, it's very hard. Uh, I mean, those, those uh, topographical lines are so close, you, it's hard to read a lot of the information on these maps. But is there a concern among staff that once we approve one uh, project like this, the, the whole uh, riverine may become developed with similar houses or, or developments? And where, where do you draw the line or, or how much more work do you have to do as you move down the bank of that, the riverine, uh, if there are requests? Uh, thank you for that, Bruce, and really good point. Uh, staff uh, do, uh, so the question is, are we setting a precedent? Thank and you. Um, do we have to relook at um, the wording in our documents to protect these areas? Can anyone answer those questions for us? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to answer the question. Thank you. Um, this is um, an unusual circumstance, um, and it's based on the... Uh, very specific topographic information. Uh, I don't think, as I said, the mapping itself identifies it as an area of, uh, of concern and identified it as an erosion hazard. And certainly that's the way we treated it until it was proven otherwise. And so I'm not sure that it would um, form the basis of, an, of a reason for any other site. This is very site specific. Uh, we are going to, as I say, ident we have identified that we do need to go back and review our mapping. We need to go back and take a second look at our uh, policies. But as far as this being precedent setting, um, uh, we recognize that it might open the door, but we feel that given the information that they have provided, they've made their case in this circumstance. Satisfied, Bruce. Okay, any other questions or comments? We've had the resolution. Oh, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, I, I think the staff made a, an excellent presentation. They made it clear that we, you know, topographical maps of what we've made is how we've made our decisions. Uh, and that, you know, engineering studies that show that the slope is, is stable and that that means the engineering will be on the hook for that. Uh, but we are confident that their, their reports are, are, are valid. Uh, and uh, what our staff are saying is that maybe we need to go back and look at some of these areas and maybe there will be some funding or availability to do engineering studies to validate what the topographical maps were saying. In this case, we've had engineering firms say that uh, the land is stable. So uh, this is the things that the, the, this provincial government is concerned about when they talk about in, uh, GRCAs having too much power when you hear that. So here we are showing our flexibility uh, as, as an intelligent, progressive GRCA. Thank you. I believe Bob was next and Joan, did you have your hand up? Okay, so Bob's next, then John. Thank you. So um, I just have two comments uh, in response to where do you draw the line? I think um, in this case, um, the road is perhaps a line. I mean, if the, the development was on the river side of the road and the slope was uh, not, not, not conforming to our policy, then we would, we have a, we would have a completely different situation. So um, it, it, it appears that um, not all development applications will fall within policy and it's our job to make um, uh, good recommendations. And I think that um, I agree with staff that this is a good recommendation. Thank you, Bob. Joan, your turn. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I I um, to feel the same way. I think that the um, developer in this case is a local, very responsible developer, and it's the house I believe they want to build. It's similar to one across the road, and um, they certainly would not want to. Um, they're not here today and gone tomorrow. So I'm uh, confident in. Uh, the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no one else with comments or questions, we will move on then. Uh, I believe we are on to 12H, is that correct, Samantha? So I'm, Sue, I can- Oh, there's Chris, good. Chris, welcome back. Thank you, sorry <laughs> about that. Drive off the road, lose your internet. I'm, these things come in three, so I'm waiting for the third item. 
Um, Still teach yourself. <laughs> uh, sh shall I read the motion, Sue? I'm not sure where we are here. It's already passed. The motion is the most best done. Twelve point seven is done. Then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate that. So moving along to the province uh, Ontario consultation, growing the size of the green belt. I think Nancy has a presentation for us. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Hopefully this comes up. And I'm working on two screens here. So somebody let me know if I'm my screen is showing. Is that correct? Yeah, you're showing Nancy. Great, thank you. All right. Um, so this morning the presentation on the uh, the province's proposal to grow the green belt. So as you heard earlier, the province has released a consultation document as proposing to expand the green belt to include the Paris Gulf Marine. The study area is the dark green color on this map and the light green area is the current limit of the green belt plan. The province has noted the map is only for discussion purposes uh, for this consultation. Uh, earlier this week, they held an information session and it was indicated that the, uh, the study area includes the marine and a 500 meter buffer area, smoothed out buffer area from the marine mapping that the province used. The consultation uh, session also uh, proposes to include portions of the Speed and the Aramosa rivers within the urban boundary of the City of Guelph and City of Cambridge. And in addition, the information session earlier this week, the province uh, also confirmed that there will be further consultation before they make adjustments to the Greenbelt boundary. The uh, Marines are made up of coarse grain materials and rolling or hummocky topography. Um, you'll hear that word again in a few minutes. The Marines do allow rainwater or snow uh, melt to infiltrate into the ground. And this water can either recharge into the aquifers, so kind of down into the aquifers, um, beneath the ground or discharge into local streams and wetlands. The Marines um, provide many key functions, such as holding water back on the landscape and attenuating flood flows. They recharge groundwater, provide base flow to the Grand River and many other water courses, uh, which improves or maintains water quantity and quality and water supplies for communities, residents, and businesses. The next few slides provide an overview of the policy framework, um, as this is an important part of the review of the potential expansion of the Green Belt. In 2017, the province updated the Green Belt Plan and the Growth Plan that applies, um, and the Growth Plan applies to most of the Grand River watershed, including the Paris Gulf Marine. At that time, many of the protective policies that are in the Greenbelt Plan were put into the Growth Plan. So this includes the natural heritage policies, the water resource system policies, and the agricultural system policies. A key theme in the Growth Plan is that the that is is that watershed and subwatershed planning is required before municipalities consider growth options. The natural heritage system was mapped by the province and will be refined through the municipality's uh, municipal comprehensive review process. However, the water resource systems are to be identified by the municipalities. So the municipal plan updates that are underway now will include water resource system and natural heritage systems. These official plans must be submitted to the province for their review by June of next year, so June 22, and the province uh, will approve or amend those uh, as required. So just a quick slide here on what is a water resource system. Uh, I've used that term a few times. A water resource system includes groundwater and surface water areas and features, uh, as well as the ecological features that are dependent on these water resources. So in this case, in terms of the marine in particular, the key hydrologic area definition would include the Paris Gulf Marine. So as stated earlier, um, the province amended the growth plan policies in 2017. In some cases, the growth plan policies are identical to the Greenbelt plan, and in some cases, the policies are similar, um, but they do have some variation in terms of protection for water resources and natural heritage systems. So for example, both plans require studies for large scale development, 
However, the Greenbelt Plan requires these studies for major development at a smaller scale than the growth plan. Under both plans, uh, watershed planning and detailed technical studies are required for settlement area expansions and large scale development. So examples of uh, the kinds of studies that may be required include you know, groundwater or hydrogeological studies, stormwater studies, water balance, and environmental impact studies. So both plans include requirements for those. The proposed expansion of settlement areas is probably one of the biggest differences between the two plans. Um, so that in terms of the growth plan, uh, expansions of settlement areas may occur um, subject to the policies of the plan. And the proposals in, this, in the growth plan do require watershed planning, but it does state they should avoid key hydrologic features um, and areas. The Greenbelt Plan does not allow for settlement area expansion, expansions into the Greenbelt. Uh, so one final uh, note here in the policy side of things is uh -huh. that um, the, under the Greenbelt Plan, municipalities cannot have more restrictive policies than the Greenbelt policies for mineral aggregate operations and agriculture. So at this time, uh, the province has not released a technical guideline uh, on identification or mapping of the water resource systems. And this kind of guideline would support municipalities in their implementation of watershed planning and other policies of both the growth plan and or the Greenbelt plan. So technical guidelines uh, are helpful in that they ensure the mapping uh, within official plans can be done consistently across municipal and watershed boundaries. And they also provide stakeholders with a clear understanding of the components of a water resource system. So the province is encouraged to consider development of these guidelines. This map also includes uh, on the left here on this slide includes the study area boundary uh, from the provincial consultation information as best we could superimpose it on a map. The GRCA review uh, of the Paris Gulf Marine and we in included a review using the hummocky topography mapping. Um, so the proposed Greenbelt expansion study area has a number of variations from the, the GRCA mapping. Um, and it's important, again, to note that the province may have included other sources of data um, that they considered. And in the future, it would be helpful uh, to have this information shared as part of future consultations. So a close up just to help illustrate a couple of points here. Um, so the black dotted pattern, and I, hopefully it shows up fairly clearly on your screen. So let's kind of see it in here and then a small piece out here. So that pattern is our hummocky topography mapping. The orange layer here is the um, natural heritage system mapping the province has developed that is being refined through the municipal reviews. And the study area is the straight line uh, kind of maroon color uh, for those that uh, can see that on your screen. So you can see in here that um, the Greenbelt expansion study areas appears to include portions of the proposed natural heritage system. However, there are also some areas mapped by the province as potential uh, natural heritage system that are right next to the study area, but they're not included uh, in the proposed uh, limit of the Greenbelt area. So right now, I think to be fair, it's unclear uh, kind of how the province is considering the natural heritage system and the water resource system in this review. So we would encourage the province to engage municipalities and conservation authorities and other stakeholders in the review of the data layers that should be considered uh, if the province proceeds with an expansion of the Greenbelt. So switching gears a little bit here, the, um, in the GTA, there are several urban river valleys that are designated uh, in the Greenbelt plan. The development is predominantly uh, between Lake Ontario and the Greenbelt. So the blue lines kind of going up here, gray being developed area, Greenbelt being green, and then the uh, urban river valleys that are currently designated kind of going from Lake Ontario up to the Greenbelt. So the province is considering new urban river valley designations and have included the Speed and Aramosa rivers in the city of Guelph and city of Cambridge in this consultation. The Greenbelt plan uh, actually uses the municipal official plan policies for urban river valleys. So the urban river valley, um, so that's a, kind of an important point in, in the distinction for the Greenbelt plan policies. 
the urban river valley designation only applies to um, what the province is deeming to be public land. So the green belt urban river policy framework, just to be clear, it's, it's a, a policy framework that is, uh, uses the, the term encourage. Um, so they're, they're not uh, shall do this, they're encourage uh, set of policies. So they encourage support for uses such as uh, linkages and connections to other natural systems or the green belt, um, environmental restoration, watershed planning and infrastructure that's appropriate. So since the, the growth plan, um, provincial policy statement, official plan policies also require or encourage similar objectives to the Greenbelt uh, Urban River Valley designation, it may not be required to achieve uh, to have, it may not be required to have uh, urban river valleys to achieve the objective. I'm sorry, Sue, did you wanna say something? I can't hear you. I will wait till she's done. Okay, so great, I, thanks. I can... Just a couple more slides, Mr. Chair. Um, so in terms of conservation authority uh, properties, I think that's an important consideration in our review. Um, by legislation, conservation authority properties are not public, considered public land under the Public Lands Act, um, but the Greenbelt Plan does identify conservation authority properties as public land. So we're recommending or suggesting the province in future consultation, um, perhaps they could clarify that conservation authorities are not uh, public lands um, in the broader sense. So it should be noted that GRCA uh, does also carry out uh, many of the actions suggested through the urban river valley policies, such as uh, undertaking watershed planning, ecological restoration, uh, fish habitat improvements, and park or trail initiatives where they're appropriate. So some of the GRCA lands also include natural hazards um, and or are ecologically sensitive and some uses may not be appropriate. So in conclusion, uh, so in conclusion, when we're comparing uh, the growth plan policies for natural heritage, water resource system and river uh, valley policies, when we're comparing them with the Greenbelt policies, there are limited differences in the policy framework. So the report, um, there are several actions outlined in the report that the province uh, should consider before proceeding with further consultation on this initiative. And these uh, actions fall into three general categories, policy mapping and process. So in terms of the, um, the policy side, we, we suggest the province should clearly identify the policy gaps that would be addressed by the Greenbelt Plan. Uh, it appears that the policy framework in place now under the growth plan, uh, the PPS and municipal official plans will identify and protect water resources and natural heritage systems. So it would be very helpful to have a, a clear articulation of uh, where those policies may fall short. Um, in terms of mapping, there are several sources of data for mapping uh, the Paris Gulf Marine and other water resources. Um, and these areas should be identified by municipalities. And this could happen before the province considers an expansion to the Greenbelt. So once this mapping is completed, uh, it should help identify potential gaps in the protection of water resources and natural heritage systems as well. And lastly, in terms of process, uh, the province should consider a deferral of an expansion of the Greenbelt until the official plans have been updated and the province has completed their review of those municipal plans. And the GRCA, uh, just in closing, would be happy to meet with the province, municipalities, and other stakeholders to assist in uh, a future review. So that concludes the presentation and the report. Uh, sorry, the, the recommendation is that we proceed with forwarding the, the comments, the board report uh, to the province through the environmental registry posting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm available for questions, as is Sonia Stranatka, uh, as our senior hydrogeologist, if there are any technical questions. All right, Nancy, thanks very, very much. Uh, a lot to think about in there. Can we uh, drop the slides? Yeah, so let me just stop share, there we go. All right. Um, uh, I guess I'll start with Sue. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, excellent report. Well done. My concerns in it that uh, the one statement you made. Okay, so the Green Belt Plan does not protect the water in the same way that the countryside line in Waterloo Region does. 
And as you uh, you heard that from our delegation earlier in the report. So um, in the provincial statement, they were stating that they will not accept uh, changes that increase the ability of the green belt. So that's directly stating they will not continue to protect our water. As most of you know, I'm the chair of TAPMO, Top Aggregate Producing Municipalities of Ontario. They want a right to take water as often and as much as they want to go below the water table, and they're not as stringent on the protection. I'm hoping this report, because it does state several places that they, that they think they should create the green belt plan with the added protections for water. And I'm hoping that that statement will resonate with the province, although I'm very fearful that it will not. The, the two things that I, at regional council, I, I told the regional councillors to look at this report because it's so well written. And also the report by Rod Regeer earlier on how the province is now taking away our rights to protect in sensitive areas. And an example is what happened in, and I believe it was Collingwood, where there was a developer who wanted to develop in, in sensitive lands and the, the municipality turned it down saying this is protected. And the province stepped in and said, no, we're going to allow it with no argument, no consultation or anything. If we don't fall under the green belt, then they are allowed to, to do this and step in at any of our um, decisions on planning and growth. If we fall under the green belt, they offer a lot of the label of protection, but we lose the further protections of waters. So it's sort of kind of a sneaky type of document that's coming forward. I have great concerns about it. I love how the, the document from the GRCA is written up. It does cover that. Lord help us all. Thank you, Sue. Bob? Uh, thanks, Chris. <laughs> I think I... I... I understood uh, uh, one section of the report that, that I'm concerned about, and, and that's that both the growth plan and the green belt policies support the construction of uh, trails and trail infrastructure along the river corridors. Is, uh, is that a correct assumption? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair. Yes, both policies as well as the official plans and, and provincial policy statement uh, do have references to trails um, and linkages along uh, river systems in particular. Um, I think the, the key is in many cases that all of those also have to go through other approvals. So, so they do permit them and encourage them and then subject to right, right, right location and willing landowner. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, other members of the board, it's, it's quite a document. Uh, we've got a recommendation there. Any other questions or comments? Warren. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madam, Mr. Chair. Um, I love geography presentations one done by our wonderful staff. Uh, I think they put it into perspective and for all of us, even those who are non-geographers would benefit from really listening to and, and reading these documents carefully. The goal, Paris Gulf Moraine is a predominant landscape in this part of Ontario. It's, it compares nicely to the Oak Ridges Moraine and it's got protection. Um, but the, the Paris Moraine, if the word hummocky, put that in your, your dictionary for Scrabble. It's a good one. If you can, can make it all the letters together. Um, but I just think the staff done a great job and I hope people listen to what we're recommending. And good luck to all of the provincial or the local governments when they work through this as well. We have to be united when we're looking at these, these issues. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Joan. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Our municipality is looking at this, of course, because it does come into grant and um, it seems our community is uh, very divided. Um, the farm community doesn't want um, green belt expansion and others do. And um, it's a hard issue to sort out, particularly when you're dealing with the PPS 
um, the growth plan. There's so many new planning documents we've been given over the last few years. And our planner at Brant County, our environmental planner has going to make a recommendation that the province combine all those documents into one that's a better tool than trying to juggle three. And um, I think our water resources do need protection. I am concerned and um, I really appreciated the staff report because um, water is our most precious resource. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Joan. Richard? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and you're doing a fine job today. I just <laughs> want, <laughs> under difficult circumstances, working out good. Well, I, I just uh, want to thank um, Ms. Davey for uh, an excellent report. I'm very, and it, it, uh, our city is very concerned about, about this, of course, because we take our drinking, all of our drinking water from the Grand River. It's important that the marine be protected. Uh, and uh, the green belt, we're in favor of the green belt to expand, at least I am. Uh, I don't wonder if I could get a copy of that PowerPoint. It was well done, uh, this e email to me so I could put it in my archive. So when someone asked me a question, I can review it. So I appreciate that. And uh, I, I do support the expansion of the green belt uh, and the province going in the right direction here. Uh, they quite, but uh, I think the mayor Fox and made it very, very clear that there may be an underlying uh, reason for why they're doing this. Thank you. All right. Um, I will read the motion and then see if there's any further comment. The motion is that report number GM 03-2125, Province of Ontario consultation on growing the size of the green belt be provided to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs through Environmental Registry posting 1931-36. Can I get a mover for that? Moved by Jerry, seconded by Sue. Any further comment? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Lots of work there for staff. It just the hits just keep on coming. So uh, up to the March flood event. Uh, why do you want to skip, share a few words on that, if you can? Sure, that's uh, fine, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have a brief presentation if you'd like it, or I could just uh, share some brief words. What would your uh, pleasure be? Uh, I think, it, why don't we just zip through the presentation just so everybody gets a full. Okay, I'll uh, quickly move through it. Um, next slide, Karen. So one of the important things to realize about this flood event was it was primarily a snowmelt driven flood event, which is very rare. And that resulted in it not being a severe flood event. If we would have had uh, rainfall combined with this flood, uh, it would have been a lot larger flood event. And we'll use this to actually help uh, refine our, our snowmelt modeling and, and that sort of thing. So we appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity that this, this event uh, presents itself with. Uh, the other thing was it warmed up slowly and a combination of uh, a gentle warm up allowed the ice to move out of the river without consequence. And it just created a more gradual melt until everything let go on the Thursday. Next slide, please. Uh, this just shows our, our snowpack heading into the event. We do go out and take manual snow measurements of uh, the snowpack. It's hard to measure snow. Uh, that snowpack had accumulated all winter. There wasn't a midwinter melt. And in the north part of the watershed, we had about 70 to uh, 112 millimeters, or about three to four inches of water in the snowpack uh, heading into the event. So again, that's a large volume of water. And if that was combined with rainfall, then we would have had a much larger flood. Next slide, please. The other thing that uh, we do prior to an event like that is we send staff into the field to do reconnaissance. They uh, basically can report uh, on river ice conditions. They check equipment in the field before we head into the event. So we're ready to go, that everything is functioning properly, supplying us accurate information that we need to make decisions during the event. And we roll that into kind of a, a summary map that gives us a picture of what the ice conditions were heading into the event. There was no major ice jams and some ice had already moved out of there certain river reaches. So it gives us a good situational awareness. 
when we're heading into uh, the flood event. But that's an important component that uh, is supplied by our field staff. Next slide, please. I summarized or in your report, give you a summary of the, the flood reduction benefit provided by the large reservoirs. Uh, it's likely uh, something people don't uh, understand if they're not working closely with it, but uh, you can see the, the amount of flood reduction that occurred uh, along the Grand River. It was between 50 and 75% of uh, the flows. That's the amount the flows were reduced. So there would have been that much more water in the river without the benefit of our reservoirs. Our rev reservoir operating curves really are designed to have the storage when most needed. Uh, in the March, April period, when we typically get our floods is when we have uh, a large amount of flood control storage. And in the fall, when we can get into hurricanes. And then of course, we're filling them in the spring period so we can add water to the river during the summer. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, there's uh, specific communities I identified that uh, did experience flooding. Uh, Grand Valley uh, and Waldemar experienced some flooding. And I put this uh, historical chart up just to provide you some context. They have had some large floods uh, in recent years. And in uh, February 2018, that was a flood of record really for uh, uh, our gauge uh, and uh, the residents of Grand Valley in recent memory. So. It just, uh, these charts provide a, a good uh, look back of where, as to where we have been and help put the current flood in context. So, you know, it, it was a, a moderate flood, but uh, certainly did flood some areas in Grand Valley. Next slide, please. We have been working now that we have uh, the LIDAR base information, we can, and we're updating floodplain mapping, we're creating flood zone mapping. Now flood zone mapping, basically several things can affect the flood forecast and where water will actually lie on the landscape during a flood. So rather than trying to get too precise, what we do is we create flood zones. And we say in this case, we're illustrating zone one, which was the flood zone that was affected in Grand Valley. And we can overlay that uh, polygon of where we expect things to flood to, identify the roads that would be affected, and the buildings that would be affected in the floodplain. And then that forms the basis for municipal emergency response plans. So it, it helps us be better prepared. It helps the municipalities be better prepared. And it's very important for succession planning where we're trying to capture knowledge and maps so that as people change in municipalities or in the GRCA, you have a continuity of, of uh, service delivery during floods. Next slide, please. The community of Drayton also experienced some flooding and again, has seen some large floods in, in recent years. And uh, again, this chart just kind of provides uh, an example. There was flooding into the fairgrounds in the community of Drayton or zone two or, or flood zone two in, Grand, in uh, the community of Drayton. Next slide, please. And in uh, the community of New Hamburg, again, there was flooding. It was into zone two, but much uh, smaller than the floods that we've seen in uh, 2020 and also in, in 2018. And that would be similar to what you would have seen in, in the community of Air also, which is downstream of New Hamburg. Next slide, please. In the community of Galt, uh, Galt uh, is uh, downstream of our large reservoirs and benefits from our large reservoirs. And this kind of gives a flood history in the community of Galt and uh, the flow reduction that was provided. Really, we, we cut uh, things by about a third. So the flow in the river was 270. It would have been 750 without uh, the effects of the reservoirs reducing flows downstream. Next slide, please. In the community of uh, or city of Brantford, again, you can see the flow reduction basically uh, cut flows by a little more than half if it was not for uh, the upstream reservoirs and much smaller than the floods that we've seen in, in recent years, thankfully, uh, certainly. Uh, but again, you can see the effects with and without reservoirs in this chart and uh, the reservoirs have been doing their job over the past few years. Next slide, please. 
And just in the lower river for uh, Bernie's uh, benefit, this is uh, in the community of York, we operate a gauge. We have gauge record back to 1974. And uh, I know Bernie was alluding to the flood risk that uh, the residents were concerned in his area of the watershed. And they likely have the memory of the flood that occurred last January and in February 2018. Those were large floods on the su Southern River. And uh, fortunately this year, uh, things went out much easier. The ice went out easier. And as you can see, really flows are about a third of what they were last year. Uh, with, uh, with the benefit of the upstream reservoirs. Next slide, please. Just touching quickly on our website. Our website's a very important service delivery component. And uh, this shows a couple of uh, graphics comparing last year and this year. And when we get into a flood, we see a ramp up of activity on our website. And that's really uh, helping us avoid getting inundated with phone calls. We put information up on the website to create awareness for the public. The public can go and self-serve and find information and that avoids them having to phone somebody. Next slide, please. And uh, the other thing is we're continuing to implement technology. COVID uh, you know, results in we have to manage a lot of things working remotely. That's relied on technology to help us get there. And even in COVID, we're continuing to innovate. This is an example of some new mapping technology that we've leveraged. So when a field staff member takes a picture in the field, it automatically flows into our database in the office and updates a real-time situational map. And uh, you know, this is a work in progress, this event, we're gonna refine it, but it's an example of how we're continually trying to improve uh, uh, the tools that we use to create situational awareness during a flood and organize information to help make and support decisions. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I can uh, take any questions. For a list of the flood warnings, if you look on uh, page 102 of your package, uh, I summarized the flood uh, messages that went out during the event to uh, give advance warning to municipalities and the public. All right, uh, thanks, Dwight. Um, anything from the board? Comments or questions, Bruce? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. A very good report, Dwight, and, and it's great to see all this technology being refined. Just uh, a question. I've, I've seen a lot of snow melts over my years in, in the rural area, but I don't think I've ever seen one that was quite as quick without a rain event at the same time as this year. And the fact that there was virtually no frost in the ground, I, had, I didn't even see any surface runoff with the snow melt that was so rapid. Is, is uh, frost levels in the ground preventing infiltration a factor that you also take into consideration, Dwight? Uh, good question to you, uh, Mr. Chair. When we take our snow surveys, we're also measuring whether or not the ground is frozen at the snow survey sites. So we try to uh, keep uh, an account of that. There is times when you get a blanket of snow, the snow acts as a blanket insulating the ground and prevents some of the deep frost penetration. Uh, when you get really cold conditions with the absence of snow is when you can get some of your largest frost penetration, particularly if the ground's frozen because the ground, the moisture conducts that cold into the ground. It was rapid this year. I think there was some frozen culverts possibly on the landscape. And what happens is sometimes they will back up water. And then once they actually unfreeze and release, you get a much more dramatic response. And certainly uh, in some areas of the watershed, particularly in the Irvine River, we suspect there was a debris blockage or some sort of blockage in that watershed because there was a very sharp response late in the event that really couldn't be explained by just a, a normal runoff. There had to be something restricting water for a period of time that released. And you can get that with some of the culverts in the rural areas where the culvert gets frozen, it backs up water into a field. And then once it finally unfreezes, you get a surge of water that goes downstream. And uh, 
we had to work into the night on Thursday night to update forecast because uh, we did see a stronger response from snow melt than we originally anticipated. Okay, thank you, Dwight. Uh, anything further? So, uh, good report. I have a motion that report number 032129, March 2021 flood event be received as information. Moved by Catherine, seconded by Brian. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. So current water shed conditions, um, if there's any questions for Dwight, we'll take those. Otherwise, I have a motion here that report number GM 032128, current watershed conditions as of March 17th, 2021, be received as information. Um, okay, I'm gonna get a mover in a second or then I'm gonna go back to questions if that's all right. Can I get a mover for this? Oh, look, I'm moving it myself. Okay, moved by Bruce, seconded by Michael. Now, uh, questions. Bernie. Thank you very much and thank you, Dwight. I guess I was calling Wolf with regard to the asking that icebreaker to be there and uh, concern about the uh, ice jam above the uh, dam in Dunville. Uh, I was pleased to see the ice go out at Port Mainland and the ice go out in Dunville at the dam. The questions I have is I know notice an indication that Lake Ontario level has uh, gone down due, some, due to some mitigation measures. I'm wondering if Lake Erie has similar uh, mitigation measures and I'm wondering if you can give me an ongoing update of the wind storm that's going now in the Dunville area. Are we experiencing flooding in Port Maitland and the Lower Grand? For you, uh, Mr. Chair, first I'll take Bernie's question regarding uh, the current conditions in, uh, uh, in Dunville. And I'm gonna try sharing a screen here. So hopefully you see a screen on our website and I'm gonna change it to it's the next two days. One thing we implemented for Lakeshore warning, this chart is dynamic. We've included the forecast from MNRF. Uh, it's forecasting that we're gonna be getting into, I believe zone three uh, and a flood warning was sent out uh, and basically there is mapping on the municipality's website on Haldeman County, and an individual resident can click on a map by property on the Haldeman County website and see what flood zone they're in. At the same time, uh, the municipal responders have the maps of what areas are affected by different flood zones so they know who to warn. So that's about an integrated uh, delivery of forecasting information to emergency responders and to the public, I think, as we can make. And really, that's where we're wanting to try to go along the river by defining uh, river reach based flood zone mapping. But uh, currently, there is a, a forecast. So, about a little past noon today, the levels are supposed to peak. A flood warning's gone out. And uh, I know Haldeman staff are, are on top of uh, that. The flood warning went out yesterday evening. But the residents can also go onto the website find this information and uh, be aware of what conditions are uh, in that area. Uh, with respect to Lake Erie, uh, the forecasts are Lake Erie is starting to decline and that's mainly due to reduced uh, runoff into the Great Lakes system in the upper lakes. So that's Lake Huron and Lake Superior and Lake Michigan and directly into Lake Erie. Um, you know, you might have noticed over this spring, it's been very dry, very little rainfall actually. Um, and that uh, affects levels in the Great Lakes. They go in cycles. We appear to be heading into a cycle where lake levels are starting to decline. There is some flow regulation at Niagara Falls, but uh, typically it's not enough to really be able to manage levels like they can on Lake Ontario. Lake Ontario is much more regulated by uh, uh, an outflow dam, whereas uh, Lake Erie uh, is really controlled by Niagara Falls and there's specific agreements on how much they can uh, uh, use for hydro production and how much they have to maintain over the falls. 
so they don't have quite as much um, effect on Lake Erie levels. The dominant thing on Lake Erie levels is how much rainfall and runoff is occurring over the drainage area uh, upstream of Lake Erie. And what we found is that, uh, you know, those levels are starting to decline because there's been less uh, precip in those areas. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the Vice Chair, it appears Chris is frozen. Sue, if you're able to, the next questions are Marcus and then Helen. Thank you, Marcus, for that. Oh, no, I don't think I had any questions. It might have just been for the motion at that time. Okay, thank you, Helen. Marcus, did you have something? No, no, Marcus didn't. And Helen's up now. Chris, you're back. Uh, Maybe not. Helen, go ahead. I'm. What am I up for? <laughs> I'm just listening to uh, the watershed report. Is there something specific? Okay. So, um, no, uh, staff thought that you had a question or comment. Oh, so we're, nope. We're done and no other questions. Oh, comment? no, I just wanted. Sorry, Sue. It was just when okay. I saw Bernie putting his hand up and I thought he was being missed. That's all. Okay, and um, so Bernie, did you have your hand up or are you just waving to us now? Okay, thank you. Are we good everyone? So um, now we are going to make a motion to go into close, is that correct? Uh, we didn't have a vote on that motion. We have a mover and a seconder, but no vote. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? The mover was Bruce Whale and the seconder was Michael Harris. Thank you, all those, uh, anyone opposed? Seeing no one opposed, it's carried. Now we have a uh, motion to go into close, I believe. Only for fire. Marcus has, oh, that's moved by Marcus, seconded by Brian. Through you, Madam Chair, that's only if there's any questions to go into close. It's just the minutes on the agenda today. Okay, so we don't, so um, are we moving the minutes? Yeah, okay, so that we'll use the same movers and seconders, please. So that was Marcus and Brian. The chair is rejoining the meeting now as well. <laughs> Where is he? Come on, Chris. Where are you? <laughs> God, can you believe? we? And, and we got $12 million in SWIFT funding. I can't imagine those folks who don't get any internet money. This is nuts. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm lost here. I don't know what Sue did. I had Marcus. Is he done? Yeah, so we're just on other business right now. Okay, great. Well, good report, Dwight. Thank you. And uh, geez, other business then. I guess we're on to Warren then, are we? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, World Water Day is an annual United Nations Observance Day held in and on around March the 22nd to highlight the importance of fresh water and is used to advocate for the sustainability management of freshwater resources. A wonderful experience. This past Monday, March the 21st, Guelph resident Nora Challoner was named this year's recipient of the annual Hugh Whitley Lifetime Achievement Award. Each year, Wellington Watchers, Water Watchers, honors one person whose passion and years of contributions to water protection transcends the ordinary, making a deep and lasting impact to water while inspiring the next generation of water protectors to consider what a lifetime of service to water could mean, create and preserve. The first recipient was Dr. Hugh Whitley himself. And today the award is expanded to honor more of the lifetime contributions of extra extraordinary water advocates in the Great Lakes Basin of Canada. This year's recipient, Guelph resident Nora Challoner, a retired public health nurse with an organic farming experience, is a longtime volunteer enthusiast of water and environmental protection. All right. Proceed. I don't know what's going on today. 
Oh, I, yeah, I think Warren's frozen. Oh, there, little shift. I'm frozen? Oh, no, go I'm ahead, not. Warren. You're back. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> frozen again. He's frozen again. Chris, I think it's an attempted overthrow of the chair. <laughs> and transforming this heritage site within the into a public Ontario Sustainability Environmental Center. Anyway, let me get to the, to the basic here. Uh, Nora has done a great deal of, of work for the environment. Um, she is a member of the Heritage Working Group of the Grand Strategy. And in 2015, Nora chaired the very successful annual Heritage Day workshop, which was held in Guelph and which attracted close to 200 people from across the watershed. We want to, at least I want to in particular, congratulate Nora Challoner for her outstanding leadership through organized advocacy for environmental enhancement in many varied aspects of community life in Guelph and in Wellington County for the past 20 years. Nora is a true Grand River watershed hero. Congratulations to Nora. Thank you. Thank, thanks for that, Warren. Very nice. And, and just a comment to Bruce, they only have coups in um, Mapleton. We're very stable down here. <laughs> All right. Did anybody have anything else for other business? Uh, Les, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, as everybody is aware that we have a, a wetlands project uh, going on in New Hamburg and um, due to the uh, a, develop, a local developer who donated a million dollars towards <clears throat> the project. And the project should be starting this spring with tree planting to get started. And <clears throat> our staff have been working with the benefactor, uh, Mr. Shout, and with Phil Holst from uh, Ducks Unlimited. So we expect that within the next month or so, we should have all the drawings for the plans but I was asked by staff and others to, to bring to the board our appreciation of one member of the GRCA staff, and that is Trevor Hayward. Haywood, and, and they want to express their appreciation for his hard work and the, all the work that he has done. And he's worked very well with everyone and everyone is so pleased with him. I mean, we're very fortunate at, at the GRCA to have the staff that we have because we, we see that with every meeting that we have, we see the, the, the great uh, work that all our staff do and how talented they are. So, but our staff wanted to really, you know, center out Trevor for the, his great cooperation and the work that he's doing with, with everyone in this project. And it's, it's a great project. It's a 55 acre, um, wetland project right next to the Nith River in New Hamburg. So we wanted to express that to Trevor and hopefully we will uh, get that back to him and, and let him know how much we appreciate and so that you are aware of the good work that he's doing. Thank you. Well, thanks, Les. And on behalf of the board, I want to thank your folks for passing on those kind words. It's always nice when staff get kudos. It's sometimes few and far between. So to have a, a an endorsement like that is really appreciated and give our thanks please to the folks back home there really appreciated is there anything guy uh yes through you the chair uh, samantha uh, is the working group still fairly active reviewing the uh, changes to the conservation authorities act uh, yeah through through you mr chair um the working group meets uh every other week and the Conservation Ontario Working Group meets weekly. So it's it's still active and hopefully something will come out shortly in terms of the new regulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's best to get, get some information that we have something to chew on. And, and part of the delay, I mean, initially this stuff was last November, right? And then it just keeps dragging and they tell us it's coming and it uh, keeps going on. So we'll get that as soon as we can. And it's really nice to have been on here for 30 seconds without freezing. So if there's nothing further, I'm going to move on to um, 
the close minutes of a, a previous session. If there are no questions, we don't need to go into close. I'll put the motion oh, oh no. there. And if somebody has questions, then we will need to. I have a motion to move by. Richard, seconded by Mr. Guy. Are there any questions on the post minutes? That is Carrie. Am I okay? Sam, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, you're a bit delayed. Yeah. Okay, so we've got the minute passed. I got a motion. Are any opposed? Those minutes no. are carried. And I think that's it. Well, so much for high speed internet. Um, I'm going to have to get my car fixed, I think, and get into the office. Okay. If there's nothing further, I want to thank you all for being here on the meeting. And uh, if we get some dates on the, the foundation issue, we'll send those out and we'll uh, go from there. We'll see you uh, next time. Sorry, Mr. Chair, we need a motion yep, to go adjourn. Ahead. Sorry. We need a motion, motion to motion. adjourn. Motion to adjourn, please. Richard and Guy, anybody?